episodes to answer questions about the technical nature of toys. Because while I'm a huge collector, I've also been blessed with getting to work in the toy industry as a brand manager and a toy designer for over 25 years. And I love answering questions. Questions that need answering. So I made a video when I first started this channel on kind of how toys are made. Um, I thought about re-recording it because I've gotten a better mic and I've gotten better at making videos since then. I've thought about re-recording some of the older videos, but maybe it's just better to kind of make specific videos like this addressing questions. And one question that comes up a lot is about tooling, toy tools. And no, I'm not talking about physical toy tools like this. I'm talking about the giant metal molds that are used to make toys. Pretty much, if it's made of plastic and it's a toy, an action figure, a doll, a car, well, it's going to start off like this. Start off like that. But if it's made of plastic in any form, it probably starts off like this. The best way to think about them are, remember those old Play-Doh molds that we had in the 80s and the 70s where you would put Play-Doh in and like shut it like a book and squeeze it tight and then you'd open it up and it would come out as the shape, whatever it was, whether it was an animal or you know a character. I think this one is supposed to be the Incredible Hulk. Better get some green Play-Doh. That's kind of what a toy tool is. It is a mold that is used to create the shape of whatever it is you want to make. And this isn't just limited to toys. It can be anything made of plastic. So let's talk about this and how these work, the history of them, and why they're so expensive to make, and how you can sort of modify them as well. So tools can vary in size from small to very large, and they're usually always made of aluminum or a very, very strong metal because they need to be inserted into a plastic injection machine, which is this giant machine here, and every time you run the tool, you're going to inject or kind of squirt hot molten plastic into the tool. Then that's why you have to make them out of metal, because they need to withstand the heat of the hot plastic. What comes out of the tool are plastic shapes. If it's a like a slug figure, like these little army men, well, then you're done. You just sort of break them off what's called the tree, which is the extra plastic parts that hold it in place there, like attached to that soldier's head and their feet. Or if it's something that has to be assembled, like an arm or a leg, each one has its own place in the tool and then pops out and gets assembled. So a question that seems to come up all the time, not just in my comment section, but on the internet in general, is why do quilts, I mean, why do toys and tools for toys cost so much? Why are they so darn expensive? Well, let's look at the history of tooling first to understand how this came about. So, tooling was invented in the late 1800s by a gentleman named John Wesley Hyatt. Not like Hyatt Hotels, but Hyatt like this guy with the beard. This is him. So, he invented the injection molded toy machine, or not toy machine, but well, <laughs> the machine that became that. And this is because when he was a little girl, he absolutely loved elephants. They were his favorite animal of all time. And he wanted to do something to save the elephants. So he wanted to find a way to make a billiard ball for playing pool out of a material that did not hurt elephants, because we all love elephants, right? Because before him, elephants were the source of ivory, which is what billiard balls and piano keys and back scratchers for Mr. Burns were made out of. So if we're not going to use ivory, what other material can we use to make billiard balls? So Hyatt came up with the idea of plastic that could be injected and formed into a shape. And that's where tooling comes from. This is, this is how tooling was created first for billiard balls. So these are examples of his balls from the late 1800s where he could now make billiard balls not using ivory and distribute them at mass using mass production. And eventually that became a modern injection molding machine, which again are very big. So why do these tools cost a boatload of money? That's the question. Doesn't it seem like you know, you can get a, a mold for a Play-Doh. I mean, that's pretty cheap. 
and you can break those and throw them out, ice tray molds you buy for 99 cents. Well, one reason is they're very heavy. Sometimes you actually need a crane to lift them up. I remember when we did the Castle Grayskull tool, they needed like two different forklifts and, and cranes to get the tool into the machine. It was so big. The other reason is they are made by hand. You have to carve out the tool. So in order to make sure that the tool reflects the sculpt of the action figure, it takes a lot of work. So a giant tool like this is used just to produce that small plastic cap you see at the bottom. The tools have to be big because they have to withstand the heat of the plastic. So a tool for an action figure is going to cost as much as a luxury car, anywhere from thirty dollars to $100,000. And there's a lot of ways tooling can be defective, which is why you also have to pay for them, because you don't want things like scuff marks or what are also called sink marks meaning the plastic sort of indents when it comes out of the tool. That you have to have a very high quality tool to avoid this. You also want every object that comes out of the tool to be uniform and the same. You don't want one arm or one bottle cap to be longer or different from the others. Now tools can be modified. As an example, this JLU Supergirl figure had the S shield carved onto her chest, if you will, or on her shirt. We modified this tool in order to make Stargirl later on, and I remember having a conversation with the engineer, T.C. Chen, who basically said, okay, if we modify this, you know that we can't unmodify it. And I was like, oh yeah, absolutely, like, we are not going to make Supergirl again, we should remove the S-Shield indention. Okay, I think I figured this thing out. You can go up and down, but not side to side or back in time. <gasps> so once you modify it, you can't unmodify it. Then, what do you do, though, with a tool once you're done with it, once you're no longer using it anymore? Well, that's also sort of part of the overall expense of the tooling process. Afterwards, most tooling is saved. A lot of companies will save their tooling anywhere from two to five years. And afterwards, they often get sold as anchors for boats in Hong Kong Harbor. I'm not kidding, they really do, because they are giant pieces of metal and they work like that. Tooling also degrades over time, so you can't just keep using the same mold over and over again. It won't produce the same quality figures, quality items out of plastic after the tool has been used thousands and thousands of times. So, from a business standpoint, with the upfront investment of tens of thousands of dollars in tooling, this has to be part of the overhead and the expense of producing, say, an action figure. When you're charging $19.99 for an action figure, well, that takes into account not only the raw materials of the figure and the plastic and getting it to retail, but you also have to cover the one-time cost of that tool. Of course, if you can take a figure and reissue it again in new packaging, you don't need to tool it again. So you've already paid for the tooling. Now, if you're putting it out a second time, well, that's fantastic. That's actually a great way for companies, toy companies, to do better if you can reuse tooling and put out the same exact figure year on year and not have to retool it because that's a one-time cost that you have to make up. But most action figures these days don't have the luxury of getting put out year after year. The need for newness and freshness at market means most figures are called one and done, meaning you put the figure out, you run him, you run the tool, you pay for the tool, you sell the figure, and now you're pretty much done with that tool. Maybe you'll reuse some arms and legs, but the full figure is not going to get re-released. So something like the Thunder Tank from Super 7 not only has to charge the customers the cost of the raw material, the plastic, but they have to recoup the expensive cost of tooling. And an item like this, you're probably talking several hundred thousand dollars in tooling to make something this big. And obviously, if a toy then gets put at retail and is sold on clearance, well, then you're losing money because you spent all this money on tooling, and if you're not making that up, baked into the retail price, well, that's how toy companies go belly up. And that has to be incorporated as part of the overall cost of the toy. I hope this video cleared up questions about tooling and the history of tooling. If you have any others, leave them in the comments below. I'll be sure to answer. Subscribe and like this channel because it tells YouTube to share it with other people. We love telling YouTube what to do. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.